Well, good morning, everyone. It's good to see each and every one of you. We're so thankful that you're here. Uh, We have visitors among us. We're very glad that you've come our way. We're honored by your presence and certainly hope that you'll stay around after services so that we can get to know you uh, better. So many thank yous to go around. Thank you for all those individuals that help us with service. Uh, We're so thankful for our Bible class teachers. This is their last Sunday before we uh, go into our new quarter of teachers, and we're thankful for those, but we're certainly thankful for uh, uh, Lindsay and Joni and uh, Amy and Emily and Jeannie, and I know Jeannie's been going through some hard times. We're thankful for the people that helped sub in. I know Cindy subbed in some, and we had others that subbed in as well. Thankful for uh, Brother Mark and uh, thankful for Harvey. We're we're thankful for all our Bible class teachers, all those. And if I missed anyone, I apologize. (laughs) It's sometimes hard to remember everybody because we do have so many that step up and volunteer to teach. And we are so very thankful for that. It's such a blessing here at Sandyvale to have those classes. It's a a very good work and, and very positive for our young people. And we're so thankful for the parents and the grandparents that bring their young people to hear God's word. What a blessing Uh, that is. You know, we think of January, we think of goals. And I think it's good for us here at Sandyville to think about our goals. And certainly when when I think about goals, uh, I think one of our goals is to be the Church of Christ. And that might seem strange to many individuals, uh, and I know that I'll say some things this morning that will offend many in the denominational world, but it doesn't mean that it's not the truth. So I'm going to try to speak the truth in love as best I can this morning and try to make it as simple as I can. What is our goal here at Sandyville? It's to be the Church of Christ. We are trying to match the Church of the Bible. And what a high call that is to match the Church of the Bible. We want to match the Church of the Bible in name, and we want to match the Church of the Bible in deed. And that is that is certainly, I believe, our goal. And thinking about that, I want to think about a little bit in, in the religious world, and certainly there will be comparisons this morning, But there is a difference between an originator and a restorer. There's a difference between an originator and a restorer. I do not want to be originator when it comes to religion. I can't afford the cost, as we're going to explore this morning. I can't afford the cost of making a new religion. I can't afford the cost of making a new church. I can't afford the cost. I can't afford it. I am not an originator. My job as a preacher of the Lord's church is just to preach the truth and what the Bible says. 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 11 says, If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified. It is not my job to be an originator. It's my job to try to match the Bible to the best of my ability. That's the job of us here at Sandyville to match the church of the Bible to the best of our ability. But there's a difference between an originator and a restorer. See, an originator is looking for something new. Originator might come up with some new things. A restorer is trying to look back, like it said in Jeremiah in our reading, look back and say, give me those old paths, give me those old ways. I want to match those. And we had such a man that was a restorer. In the Old Testament, there was King Josiah. In 2 Kings chapter 22, if we just think about him a little bit this morning, in 2 Kings chapter 22, in the Old Testament, we see that Josiah is going to become king at eight years old. He's going to get a few more years on him before actually the old law is found. And we can't summarize the whole story, but we do have Josiah, he becomes king, and his father and his grandfather were not the best of kings. In fact, as we study their history, we realize they were very bad kings. And Josiah becomes king at eight years old, and then his years go on, and they, and they send some individuals to the temple, and they start looking through the house of the Lord, and they find the law. They find the law, and they bring it to the king. They bring it to King Josiah. He's now in his 20s. They bring it to King Josiah, and in and, and, uh, 2 Kings chapter 22 and verse 11, I'm going to kind of skip some verses, but here's what happened. It says, Now it happened when the king heard the words of the book of the law that he tore his clothes. So Josiah is a king probably in his 20s or so, and he has, his father wasn't doing what the law said, his, grand, uh, his grandfather wasn't doing what the law said, and he finds and they bring the law to him, and they read it to him for the first time, and he tears his clothes. Why is Josiah tearing his clothes? Because he realizes that they have not been doing what the law said. 
There's a difference between an originator and a restorer. Josiah realizes that they are not practicing the old ways. They are not doing the old things. They are not doing things that they should. In 2 Kings chapter 22, if you look at verse 13, he says, Josiah says, Go inquire the Lord for me, for the people and for all of Judah, concerning the words of this book that has been found. For it, it for great is the wrath of the Lord, that is aroused against us because our fathers have not obeyed the words of this book to do according to all that is written concerning us. Josiah was a restorer. He was not an originator. His father didn't follow the law. His grandfather didn't follow the law. He finds the book. He finds the law. He starts to read it. He hears it. And he says, you know what? We're not doing what the Bible says. In terms of the Old Testament, the old law. He says we're not doing it. You know what? Josiah makes it a mission for the rest of his life to restore what the Bible said in the Old Testament. To do those things that were right in the Old Testament. Now many people will not want to do this. But that's what we're trying to do here at Sandyville, isn't it? We're trying to be the church of the Bible. And when we read the New Testament and we start to read it, do we tear our clothes and say, you know what, we don't match the church of the Bible because we don't match in name and we don't match in deed. Our goal is to be just like Josiah, to read the book and say, you know what, we're not doing it right. We're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, and we need to make sure we match. I don't think that should be a controversial idea. If we don't match what the Bible says, we should make every effort in our power to make sure that we match what the Bible says. Our goal here at Sandyville, as we go into this next year and all of the years following, is that we match the church of the Bible in name and in deed. That's our goal. We're not trying to originate anything new. We're trying to restore. We're trying to be the church that we read of the pages in the Bible. Like it says in Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 16 and 17, give me the old past. I don't want to create something new, basically. It says, thus says the Lord, stand in the ways and see and ask for the old past where the good way is and walk in it. Then you will find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. There are many people that will read the Bible and they'll realize that they don't match what the Bible says, but they will not change. That is not our goal here at Sandyville. If we find where we don't match the Bible in word or deed, we're going to make a change. We're going to do it as quickly as possible, as efficiently as possible, as effectively as possible, because we want to match what God has said. We have to ask ourselves a question this morning. Who do we want to please? You know, in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, Paul writing there, he says, Do I seek to please men or God? Or am I trying to persuade men or God? He said, for if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Who are you trying to please? Are you trying to please God or men? Because Paul kind of says there in Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10, he says, who am I trying to please? Who do you think I'm trying to please? Who do you think I'm trying to persuade? He says, I can tell you this. He says, if I was trying to please men, I wouldn't be a Christian, and I wouldn't be a member of the Lord's church, the church of Christ, if I was trying to please men. In Galatians chapter 4, in the same letter, chapter 4 and verse 16, he says, Therefore have I become your enemy, because I tell you the truth. You know, there's a lot of things that people say about the church of Christ. But really, I think we could kind of summarize it as we are just trying to match the church of the Bible. We're trying to match the church of the Bible by name, and we're trying to match the church of the Bible by deed. We try to read the Bible, and we try to make sure that we're doing those things that are good and right, those things that have been laid forth. And when we see things that we don't match up on, we're going to rip our clothes and we're going to say, you know what, we need to do better. We need to be better. We need to do those things. We're not going to try to make anything new. You know, a lot of times people try to say the Church of Christ is just like another denomination in a sea of denominations. But I think there is an argument against that. It's that we're trying to match in name and deed. If we match the Bible in name and deed, we're the church of the Bible. And that's what we want to be. Amen. That is what we want to be. You know, in high school for the first time, I had never heard about Alexander Campbell. I was probably a junior in high school, and I was in discussions with uh, some kids of one of the local preachers, 
And I think I might have stirred up that household a good bit because I was just saying, hey, I, I want to be part of the church of the Bible and I want to do what the church of the Bible does. And I started bringing up these things. I said, look at this Bible verse. This is what the church does. The church partakes of communion on the first day of the week, every first day of the week as far as I can tell. And then look, they give on the first day of the week. And I started bringing these things up and I think their kids ran off to, to dad and, and dad started talking to him and they said, don't worry about that crazy guy. He's just a Campbellite. They're just a, another denomination. You know, there's an easy test for that. Easy test is if we can find the Church of Christ anywhere before Alexander Campbell, that's a full argument. But see, people don't like to look into it. The Church of Christ can be tracked, I believe, all the way through history. But more importantly, it can be found in the pages of this book. It can be found in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 is where the church started. It wasn't any denomination back then. It was the one church, the true church. It was the church of the Bible, and that is what I want to be. I want to be added to it. I want to be a, a part of the Lord's church, the church of Christ. You know, I've talked to a lot of people over the years. You know, I've had people brag about the starting points of their church. I went to college with a young lady. She was bragging about a particular domination, and she said, you know what, this is the 500th anniversary of this denomination starting. And I just always like, what? If I want to be part of any church, I don't want to be a church, part of a church that started by man. I want to be part of the church of the Bible. I want to match it in word and deed. Anything else would be a waste of my time. If we can find the church of Christ anywhere before Alexander Campbell... And Alexander Campbell is not the one we look to. And I never looked to Alexander Campbell. He might be a brother in Christ, but I didn't know about Alexander Campbell until people started using it as an argument against me. I just want to be part of the church of the Bible. I want to match in word and deed. I don't think that's controversial. I don't think we should be trying to make new denominations. I don't think we should do, try to do anything new, try to bring anything new in. We can just follow the pages of the Bible, and if we do what they did, we can be exactly as they were. We can find the Church of Christ in the Bible. I think we can find it multiple places. Romans chapter 16, verse 16 would be one place. Salute you one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. You can find it in the pages of the Bible. There's many things today that you can't find in the Bible. And if we can't find it in the Bible, if Josiah couldn't find what his dad and his grandfather were doing, if he couldn't find it in the law, he had an issue with it. And if we can't find it in the Bible as well, I believe that we should have an issue with it. Number one, let's talk about name. If we're going to be the church of the Bible, if we're going to try to be the God's people, then we need to make sure that we match in name. Now that seems basic, but a lot of people do push back on this point. But we should match the name that we should be. We shouldn't be anything else. In Acts chapter 2, we see the start of the church. The question is, is whose church is that? Acts chapter 2, there's a church that starts. People are added to it. We see it. Whose church is it? I believe it's the church of Jesus Christ. It's the church of Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it's talking to the elders. It says, Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God which he purchased with his own blood. The church of the Bible was purchased by Christ's blood. And I'll go back to my point. I can't afford to start a new church. And I don't think anyone can. It was purchased by his own blood. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28. The church of the Bible was purchased by Jesus Christ. In Ma Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, a conversation between Peter and Jesus, he says, uh, you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Now a lot of people say it was talking about Peter. If you look at the conversation, Peter just confessed that Jesus was the Son of God. And I believe that Jesus is saying, based on that fact, I'm going to build my church. Whose church? Jesus' church. The church of Christ. The church of Christ was purchased with the blood of Jesus Christ. Why would we call it any other name? Why would we call it any other name? Well, well Kai, are there any other acceptable names in the Bible? Yeah, I believe so. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 2, it talks about church of God. I think the church of God and the church of Christ are the same thing. I think both of those are acceptable names. 
Well, are you sure, Kyle? Well, John chapter 17 and verse 10 says this. This is Jesus speaking. John chapter 17 and verse 10, it says this. This is Jesus speaking. He says, all mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. What's Jesus saying? All that's mine, God, is yours, and all yours is mine. What is Christ is God's, and what's God's is the church. Christ and God's church is the same church. It's not a different church, it's the same church. You might think of it this way, and this might not be the best example, but McDonald's. Does McDonald's go by other names? Yeah, you might call it the Golden Arches. Is it still McDonald's? Oh, yes, it is. Church of God, Church of Christ, it's the same name. It's the same ownership. McDonald's and the Golden Arches, that's the same thing. If we're going to match the church of the Bible, we better not be running off to grab some other name, whatever it is, and slap it on ourselves because I think that's disrespectful to the owner and the originator of the church. In, th in fact, I can't think of anything that's more insulting. Amen. I, I really, really cannot think of something more insulting. Let's do it this way. You just paid off your house. You just paid off your house. You made the last payment for your house. I walk into the room. You're about to get the deed, and I say, hey, put my name on that. We said, I paid many years for that. I made my payments year after year after year after year. I paid for it. Shouldn't I own it? But in the religious world, people run into the room and say, you know what? I'm going to slap another name on that deed after somebody else has paid for it. It doesn't work that way. You know, it's an easy way to count, uh, catch a counterfeit. You know, you think about McDonald's. You know, uh, you think about a, a place that's serving all McDonald's food, but they put Wendy's on it. Well, if I walk into a place and it's serving a Big Mac and a Quarter Pounder and those type of things, if it's doing all those things at McDonald's and it's got Wendy's on it, uh, you might have a little lawsuit on your hands. <laughs> I don't think that's going to last too long. You know, I open up a McDonald's and say, hey, this is Kyle's place, but I'm serving the Big Mac, the Quarter Pounder, fries. I'm serving all of that, but I, I'm going to call it Kyle's place. I'm not going to get away with that for too long. I'm not going to get away with that. See, we understand that. We understand that idea. But yet in the religious world, people have run away from that, haven't they? They've run away from that. Is if I want to be a member of the Lord's church, I better call it by Christ's name. So Church of God, Church of Christ, those are both acceptable names we see in the Scripture. In John chapter 17, verse 10, it says, All mine are yours, and all yours are mine, and I'm glorified in them. I don't view that as a conflict at all. But sometimes people say name just doesn't matter. Well, the Apostle Paul had a little issue with names. In 1 Corinthians chapter three, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, rather, verses 11 through 13. Paul had a little issue with names. The church at Corinth, they're running around and saying they're following different people. And, and here's how that goes in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 11 through 13. It says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, my brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Some say this, that each of you says, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, I am of Cephas, I am of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Sometimes people say, I don't have any issue with names. Paul did. There's people in the Corinthian church says, oh, I'm following Apollos. I, you know, he's the one I'm kind of following. Another one saying, oh, I'm following Paul. And Paul goes, this is ridiculous. Why would you slap some man's name on you? Jesus died for you. He was crucified for you. He paid the price. He purchased the church with his own blood. And yet you're going to try to grab some other name and try to attach it to yourself. It's disrespectful. Disrespectful. I, 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 it is one of the few things I, I would almost rather the whole denominational world change the church of Christ. They make it easy, don't they? You know why we don't have the same names? Because we're different. We don't have the same names because we're different. Wendy's and McDonald's don't have the same name because they're different. And, I mean, really, it makes it easy. Makes it easy. But yet people run away many times. They'll run away from the name of the Lord who purchased the church with his own blood. Acts chapter 20 and verse 28, they'll run away. Paul had an issue with names. And I've got a little thing with names as well. Because in Acts chapter 4 and verse 12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I'm a names person. 
I don't know about you. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Nor is there salvation in any other. There is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. I'm not running to any other name. I'm not running to Apollos. I'm not running to Paul. I'm not running to Peter. I'm, not run I'm running to Jesus Christ. That's where I'm running. If we do the same things, we can be just as they were. In Isaiah chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, let us reason together. I think we understand this idea very well. In fact, there was a gospel preacher. He was going to preach at a gospel meeting. I might not get the, the story exactly right, but he was driving by a denomination, and he said, hey, I'm trying to find the, the Church of Christ. And he has a little conversation. The person was a little bit irritated with him, and they say, oh, it's down the road and to the left. And he said, okay. He, he keeps on driving. A second later, he catches something in his rearview mirror. The person's waving. He comes up to the, the, the window and says, you know what? This is the church of Christ. This is a Baptist church of Christ. I think he realized what he said. I, I think he realized when he said, hey, I'm looking for the church of Christ, and the guy says, oh, oh, down the road and, and to the left, I think he made a connection there. He made a connection that, whoa, me not calling myself the church of Christ might be an issue. So he's like, whoa, 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 uh, uh, we are the church of Christ, with a little caveat. I don't want any caveats. I don't want any men's names. I don't want any of that attached. I want to be the church of the Bible, and that's what I've been fighting for since I've been about 16 years old. I never look back. We all have a different story on leading us to the Lord's church. My parents were members of the Lord's church, and I had a rebellious phase, and I told my parents, basically, I will be part of any other group but this. And then you know what? I took my Bible, and I started searching. <laughs> and I couldn't find anything else in the Bible. I went, I went to, my, to my friend who, who was the son of the local denominational preacher and this other denominational preacher. I went here, there, or everywhere. I've got a lot of denominational knowledge because I thought I was going to prove my parents wrong. But I couldn't find any other church in the Bible. We don't all have the same stories. My grandma's story is not the same as mine. She raised in a denomination. She started to realize things that she did at her denomination were not in the Bible. She started to keep a little notebook. And that list kept getting longer and longer. And eventually that list got so long that she packed up her stuff and she got kicked out of her house. And she became a member of the Lord's church. She said, I just want to do what's in the Bible. If I want to be a member of the Lord's church, I'm going to have to do what they did. In Acts chapter 2, we see that they were baptized for the remission of their sins. And in verse 41 in Acts chapter 2, it says that they were added to something. It says they were baptized and they were added to something. Well, if you go to verse 47, it says uh, that, that they were added to the church. But I can't play the high price to originate. If you were there in Acts chapter 2, where all these people were baptized for the remission of their sins, and they're being added to the church, if you walked up to them and said, Hey, what denomination are you a part of? I don't think they would say anything that we can't find in the pages of the Bible. Agreed? They're not going to throw out some man's name. They're not going to throw out some denomination's name. In fact, some of our brethren in some places, they just call themselves the church. They don't even clarify with Christ or God. And I think that's acceptable as well because there's only one church. What do you mean there's one church? I've never heard that before. There's only one church of the Bible. There's only one church that's bought and paid for. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, we, we gather some very important information. Galatians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23. It says, And he put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things of the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 22 and 23, it's talking about Jesus, and he, he's put all, God has put all things under his feet, and gave him to be head over all things of the church. Christ is head of the church. But it says the church is what? His body. Head over all things to the church, which is his body. Christ is head of the church. Christ is head of his body. That makes a whole lot of sense. 
In Ephesians chapter 4, in the same letter, chapter 4, verses 4 through 6, it says this. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. No use of misquoting it. Chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. There is one body. Wait, in chapter 1 it said the body and the church are the same thing. It says there's one body and one spirit, just as you are called, one hope you are calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. There's only one church, and I know that's extremely controversial today, but you know how we can be the one church is if we match what the Bible says. That's the only way. We cannot add to, we cannot subtract. That's the only thing that we can do. And we see here that the body and the church are the same thing. In Ephesians chapter 4, it says there's one body. There's one body. There's one group of the saved. And those are the individuals that follow the Bible, are baptized for remission of sins as we see in Acts chapter 2, and they're added to the church. And then certainly we see the things that the church, uh, the, the, the things that the church does. In Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 26, it says that Christ is the Savior of the body. He's the Savior of the body. He's the Savior of the church. The world would have us have a religious monster. The Bible clearly teaches there's one head and there's one body. You have one head, you have one body. Makes a whole lot of sense. The religious world says, oh, there's multiple heads out there on one body. No, that's not how it works. That's a, that's a religious monster. Other religions say, you know what, there's one head. All our head is Christ, but we've got all these bodies. That's a monster as well. What creature do you see running, out, running around with one head and multiple bodies? It doesn't make a whole lot of sense. I know this is controversial. I know it's, it's not easy, but... Jesus said, John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Except through me. You know, Paul pleaded that we'd be unified, and I think he wanted to be unified by one name. I fight for unity. I love unity. I want us to be unified, but Paul, when he pleads for unity, he lets us know how we can be unified. In uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, he says, Now I plead with you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, that there be no divisions among you, that you be perfectly joined in the same mind and in the same judgment. You want to be unified. We want to be unified. We have to speak the same thing. We have to have the same mind, and we have to have the same judgment. Some people would say impossible. I think it's possible. The only way it's possible is if we practice this book. That's the only way. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do it with the ability which God supplies, then all things God may be glorified. Paul pleaded for unity, and he told us how it could be accomplished. If we speak the same thing, we have the same mind, we have the same judgment. The only way that can happen is we get more of the word into our mind, and it's less of us and more of the Bible. Less of my opinions, less of my thoughts, more of what the Bible says. You know, Jesus prayed for unity. You think Jesus wanted a thousand denominations running around out there? Or did he want us all to be one, under the same name? Saying the same things, having the same mind, doing the same things. In John chapter 17, verses 20 and 21, Jesus prays there. He says, I do not pray for these alone, but also on those who will believe in me through their word, that they all may be one, as you, Father, and me, and I, and you, that they may be one in us, that the world may believe that you sent me. If I want to be part of the church of the Bible, I need to match in name. But you know what? We also need to match in deed. Could there be a McDonald's out there that doesn't do McDonald's things? I think it's possible, right? We talked about McDonald's and the Golden Arches, you know, but we also talked about a Wendy's that's serving McDonald's food. That doesn't work. That's not allowed. That's called a lawsuit. Okay? That's not going to happen for too long. But we've got another issue when we start to think about it. We've got somebody that says, I'm McDonald's, but they're not doing McDonald's things. Or you've got a Walmart who's not doing Walmart things. If we're going to be the church of the Bible, we better say we're the church of the Bible. But not only should we say that we're the church of the Bible, we better do what the church of the Bible does. We better do what Christians do. And you know what? That's something that we need to think about and consider. In Matthew chapter 7, it talks about us making judgments. It talks about making judgments in terms of false teachers. 
And it talks about trees. And I think we can understand this illustration. It says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, it says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. The men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles. Even so, every good tree bears good fruit, but a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut off and thrown into the fire. This is talking about false teachers. Could a false teacher say, I'm a good teacher? Oh, yeah. How are you going to tell if it's a good teacher or a bad teacher? You're going to tell by what they do. And we should be able to tell a church whether they're the church of the Bible by what they do. Well, how are we going to know that? We're going to read. What does the church of the Bible do on the first day of the week? How does the, how does the uh, church of the Bible worship? How does the church of the Bible, how do the members conduct themselves? We have to put those things to the test. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23, it says, Whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. The question is, is who are we trying to please in this life? If we're trying to please God, we need to get His Word. We need to cling to it desperately. There's a reason that the denominational world is not united. Because we will not really truly unite after one name, and we will not do what that one name tells us to do. That's why we're not united. You don't think that the religious world is not divided? Oh, the religious world is extremely divided. Look around. Drive through a town. The religious world is divided. It's not what God wanted. Why are we divided? We're divided over the same things that people divided over from the beginning of time. Even the Jews struggled. Well, what what did the Jews struggle with sometimes? Well, sometimes the Jews, God's people, wouldn't worship correctly. We understand that, right? There are certain times in the past where the Jews, God's people, should have been worshiping the way that God told them to, and they weren't. So what happened is it caused splits and rifts that shouldn't have happened. We have to make sure that we're doing what God wants us to do in the area of worship, organization, and our conduct, all these things. You know, Jesus highlighted worship as an issue. In Matthew chapter 15, verses 8 and 9, he says, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me, and in vain do they worship me, teaching the doctrines and the commandments of men. What is he saying? He said, All these people speak a good game. They say, We love God. We love God. We want to worship God. But when it comes to it, they're not doing what God told them to do to worship. They're going off and doing what they want to do to worship. And we see that all throughout the Bible. We see it in Genesis chapter 4. The first recorded worship that I think is in the Bible, Genesis chapter 4, we've got two brothers, Cain and Abel. Cain says, you know what? I'm going to offer the fruit of the ground. Abel says, you know what? I'm going to offer a blood sacrifice. God says he accepts Abel's sacrifice, but basically he doesn't accept Cain's sacrifice. In the New Testament, it tells us, it gives us a little bit more information why he accepted Abel's sacrifice. It says in Hebrews that Abel offered by faith. Well, what's faith? Well, Romans chapter 10 and verse 17 says, Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. God must have told these brothers what he wanted for worship, and one decided, I'm going to do what God wants, and the other said, I'm not going to. See, you can't just say you're a Christian or you're the church of Christ. You have to make sure that you're matching what the church of Christ does. In John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, it says, The hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit and those who worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. We have to worship God in spirit and in truth. Well, what's truth? What is truth? You know, Pilate asked that question. What is truth? You know what it says in John chapter 17 and verse 17? Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. If I'm going to worship God correctly, if I'm going to worship him in spirit and in truth, what's truth? It's God's word. I've got to make sure that I'm doing what God has asked me to do. There's a lot of people in the Bible that said, you know what, we're not going to do it God's way. A good example, Leviticus chapter 10. Leviticus chapter 10, we have Nadab and Abihu. They're the sons of Aaron. They're the sons of Aaron, and they are having a worship service, perhaps the first worship service at Mount Sinai, and, and we, have, we have them who offer strange fire before the Lord. 
and the fire comes out and consumes them. They offered fire that was not commanded. If we want to be the church of the Bible, we better do what the Bible says. We could talk about all kinds of things. We could talk about giving. What does the Bible have to say about giving? If I want to be the church of the Bible, I better match what the Bible says about giving. What does the Bible say about communion? I better match what the Bible says about communion. If I am going to be the church, part of the church of the Bible, we need to be organized the way that the Bible says be organized. You know how the Bible says a congregation of its people should be organized? Elders and deacons and members. In the denominational world, can you find an elder? You might find an elder, but they're not qualified. Well, what are you talking about qualified? What are you talking about? Well, if you go to 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1-7, through 7, it talks about an elder, the position, and what the qualifications are. If we're going to be the church of the Bible, we better match up with what those say. If we're going to have deacons, those better match the qualifications that are in the Bible. The denominational world has run away from elders. Because you know what an eldership eliminates many times? Corruption. Because we never see one elder in the Bible. It's always a plurality of elders. And we also have the independence of congregations. We don't have time to talk about all this this morning. But God, when he set up the elder system, it was a protection against corruption. And you know what? The denominational world, they don't want to have an eldership. They want to have one guy running the show. I don't run the show here at Sandyville. I do not. I do not. One, I don't meet the qualifications of an elder. I don't meet the qualifications of a pastor. I don't meet the qualifications of a bishop. All I am is a preacher. And I will abide by what God has said and how he has scripturally organized the church. And I will follow that to the best of my ability. I'm under the eldership. And I will serve to my very best. But I don't run the show here at Sandyville. But the denominational world, somehow they lost elders along the way. They lost elders. They lost qualifications. Many of these denominations have said, you know what? We're going to be like Nadab and Abihu. We're going to offer strange fire to the Lord. Strange fire that God did not ask for. Oh, God, I'm going to offer you these fruits and vegetables. That's not what God asked for. Oh, God, I'm going to offer you this. That's not what God asked for. That's not what God asked for. For do I now persuade men or God, or do I seek to please men? For if I still please men, I would not be a bondservant of Christ. Galatians chapter 1 and verse 10. Are we being the church of the Bible? You know, God gives us everything we need. But it's funny how we run away from everything that we need. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it says, His divine power has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. All our answers are right here. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. We have everything we need right here. You know what I encourage everyone to do? <sighs> Blow the dust off your Bible. It's time for us to restore. It's time for us to be like Josiah and rip our clothes and say, you know what? Dad, Grandpa, they weren't doing what the Bible said. That's what Josiah said. I'm not saying it was easy for him to say that. But Josiah was convicted for the rest of his life. Tear down the high places. Tear down these false places of worship. I want to do what the Bible says. And certainly that is what our goal is here at Sandyville. Are we perfect individuals? Certainly not. But we know where our answers are. We know the pattern that we're trying to follow. And we are going to try to follow that to the best of our ability. God has given us the seed, the word of God. If we plant this seed, it will grow. And it will not grow something that it's not supposed to grow. If you take this Bible and you don't add or subtract from it, it will grow the church of Christ. That's what it will grow. In John chapter 1 and verse 21, it says, Therefore let us lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Right here. It's all we need. I know this is not the easiest message for people to hear, but I, I think honestly it makes sense. 
Jesus purchased one church. If he purchased that church, it should go by his name. And that church should do the things that are written in the Bible. And if we add to or subtract, we're in trouble. Because we can see people all throughout the Bible that fell into such a situation. You know, when we look at people becoming Christians in the New Testament, we see a pattern starting in Acts chapter 2. We see that they hear the word, they believe, they repent, they confess, and they're baptized. We see in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38, they're baptized for the mission of sins, and they're added to the church. Satan is the master of lies. Satan has done everything he can to tell people baptism isn't for remission of sins, but that's what the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 and verse 38. In Acts chapter 22 and verse 16, Ananias says, Why are you waiting? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord, and you'll be added to the church. You know, Jesus, some of his last words, Matthew chapter uh, 28, verses 19 through 21, says Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to deserve all things that I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. That's our mission today, and it should be our mission and goal here at Sandyville to be the church of the Bible, nothing more and nothing less. Perhaps you need to become a New Testament Christian. Perhaps you need the prayers of the church. We'd love to help you any way we can if you come as we stand as we sing.